Well, hi everyone, and welcome to tonight's very special event celebrating Amy Lutz's wonderful new book, We Walk Life with Severe Autism. I'm Allison Singer. I'm the founder and president of the Autism Science Foundation. I wish I could see all of your faces in person, not just your names on the list. I cannot wait until we can get back to holding these events in person so we can all see each other and hug. Um, I hope everyone is getting vaccinated so that that day can come quickly. Uh, before we get started tonight, I wanna thank our community events manager, Julie Berger, for helping organize this wonderful talk tonight. And I especially want to thank our co-host, Jonah Zimelis, the owner of Words Bookstore in Maplewood, New Jersey, who is the newest member of the Autism Science Foundation Board of Directors. So Jonah, I will hand the Zoom floor over to you. Thanks, Allison. Um, welcome everybody. Um, my wife, Ellen, who is on tonight um, as an attendee as well, and I are the owners of Words Bookstore. You can see us uh, in the background. Um, here in Maplewood, New Jersey. Um, we get, for those of you who don't know us, we opened our bookstore 12 years ago with two missions. One of which is to provide jobs and vocational training to young people with autism. And we've had over a hundred young people with autism work in our bookstore. We also serve as a hub, literary hub for the community. And we've host about a hundred author events a year. And we're sorry that we have to, as Allison pointed out, have to be doing this on Zoom, but we're glad that we're able to reach so many of you. And um, we're terrifically, we're especially pleased um, about tonight's event to bring our longtime friend, Amy Lutz to you. Amy was with us for her last book, Each Day I Like It Better, um, about autism and ECT. And um, this book, We Walk, so in, in addition to doing uh, autism employment, we do lots of um, events about autism and have meetings about autism. And um, we carry several hundred books on autism. And this book, We Walk, is really at the very top of our list. We love it um, and we're so thrilled about it and such an honor uh, to have Amy here. And again, we hope to have her in person sometime you know, soon, and we hope you'll all join us then. We also want to announce, I think that Allison has sent, and, and the Autism Science Foundation has sent out links. We hope that you'll buy We Walk and buy it from us, and we're going to be donating all of the profits from the sales to the Autism Science Foundation. So we hope that'll give you all a little extra incentive to go out and buy this terrific book, buy it for your friends. Um, and, and, and that's the story. So Allison, I don't know if you'd like to say anything else about Amy or we'd love to hear her talk about her book. Yeah, I'm gonna say a few things first. But <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows I'm gonna say a few things first. <laughs> I have to embarrass Amy a little bit before we let her have a book. Uh, so before I introduce Amy, I wanna just tell everyone a little bit about the Autism Science Foundation. Our mission is to support critically needed autism research uh, to help understand the causes of autism and to develop new treatments for people with autism. Uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, we've worked closely with universities to ensure that autism research continues to move forward um, and by supporting the development of virtually delivered therapies and even virtual diagnosis of young children whose parents suspect they are having a developmental delay. Uh, we are a group of parents and scientists working together to provide support for families and to improve access to treatment. And part of our mission has always been to share the latest science with all autism community stakeholders. So I hope that you will all register for our upcoming day of learning on April 22nd, where we will talk specifically about how COVID has affected the lives of people with autism and their families. We'll also hear more about the latest research around seizures in people with autism, as well as the latest information on the cannabidiol research in people with autism. Uh, the event will be held virtually, so you can join from anywhere in the world and the tickets are free. I first founded the Autism Science Foundation because I have a daughter, Jody, with severe autism and an older brother, Stephen, who also has profound autism. Jody's now 23. And back when she was diagnosed, there were several different types of autism that a person could be diagnosed with, 
that gave some indication of their relative level of functioning, such as Asperger's syndrome, pervasive developmental disorder, and classic autism. But in 2013, the way we diagnose autism changed, and everyone who met the minimum criteria for, was diagnosed the same with autism spectrum disorder. In fact, in my opinion, the word autism is now so broadly applied that it is practically meaningless. A person diagnosed with autism can have a genius level IQ or have intellectual disability. It can include someone who has no language, minimal language, or perfectly intact language. It can be used for a person who has self-injurious and aggressive behaviors, or someone who has difficulty navigating the social scene in the middle school cafeteria. It can describe a person who graduated from Harvard Law School, or an individual like my daughter who exited high school with a certificate of participation. And the people with autism that we see in the media, on television shows, and at the policymaking table tend to be those with higher functioning autism. Television shows like The Good Doctor, The New Normal, The Big Bang Theory, Love on the Spectrum, they all portray high functioning people with autism as surgeons and as scientists. No one wants to do a sitcom about people with autism who are aggressive or self-injurious. And so a large portion of the autism population, those with severe and profound disability, are left behind, forgotten. Which is why I am so glad that Amy wrote this book. In her book, she shines a bright spotlight on the realities of severe autism, the challenges, the monotony, the mess, but also the joy and the triumph that our children experience. Like Jonah, I have read many books about autism, but never one that better captured my own family's reality. Amy's writing about severe autism has been featured on many platforms, including Psychology Today, The Atlantic, Slate, and Spectrum. Her first book, uh, Each Day I Like It Better, which Jonah described, was published in 2014. And her new book, the one we'll hear about tonight, was just published earlier this year. She's a founding board member of the National Council of Severe Autism and is currently, in her spare time, pursuing her doctorate in the history of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. It's my great pleasure to introduce Jonah and my good friend, Amy Lux. Thank you so much, Allison and Jonah. I, um, I'm so happy to be here and I've just been looking at all the people who are here and I'm so happy to see so many names I recognize and so many people who I hope will be friends in the future. Um, as you noted, I write a lot about severe autism and anybody who's read anything that I've written knows that I, really don't write too often about the positive side of severe autism because keeping it real, severe autism can be very grim. There's a lot of dark moments. There are a lot of struggles that families have. There's a lot of suffering. And you use the expression, you know, shine a light on severe autism. That's always been my purpose, just to remind everybody that, that the, you know, the quirky genius model of autism isn't the only model out there. But as I was kind of preparing for tonight and deciding about what I wanted to read from this book, I realized I didn't want to read about the grim realities of severe autism. I think many of, I'm probably preaching to the converted anyway, most of the people here are connected to severe autism in some way. And more, but more than that, just the warmth I felt thinking about you and Jonah doing this for me and having so many of my friends and allies here, I felt really supported and very nurtured. And I wanted to do something that I never ever do, which is read from probably the most positive thing I've ever written about autism, which is the first essay in this book called We Walk. So I'm just gonna read for a few minutes, the, the very beginning and the, the very end of this essay. It's a little more than a mile from our vacation home in Gardner's Basin to the northern end of the Atlantic City Boardwalk, another mile and a half to the pretzel factory, which now opens inconveniently at nine, although it used to open earlier. 
My autistic son, Jonah, walks that five mile round trip every morning we're in Atlantic City, usually with me, sometimes with our nanny, occasionally with my husband, Andy. If they wake up early enough, one or two of his four siblings might join us for the breakfast treats they earn, but Jonah goes every day. The streets are quiet at 7.30, but not deserted. We pass people walking their dogs or waiting for the jitney to take them to their casino jobs. In front of the public housing project, a few men and women in baggy clothing smoke in plastic chairs. We exchange brief pleasantries. I know if I encourage Jonah to be friendly, he will simply parrot me, Gracie Byrne style, say good morning, Jonah, so I speak for both of us. The people we pass nod and smile. Do not stare. They see Jonah walk by him or even biting his fist and squawkable to them. We used to be able to cut across the park and join the boardwalk where it stretched above the ocean on wooden pilings so high that when Jonah occasionally kicked one of his flip-flops over the edge, as he was wont to do when my attention was diverted, my only option was to stick the other one in my bag and keep going. His soles are so thick and tough from his virtually lifelong aversion to shoes that he rarely got splinters. Parenting in general, and special needs parenting especially, is about choosing your battles. I very early gave up on shoes. Jonah's much better about it now, as he is with most things. But when he was two or three, I spent 20 minutes every day wrestling him into sneakers he would kick off in seconds, while I wondered why it was taking so long, given the skyrocketing autism rate, for someone to invent irremovable shoes, which I imagined as little straight jackets for feet. But that entire stretch has been closed since Superstorm Sandy accelerated the slow decay that had left the boardwalk warped and gap-toothed where there were no casinos to maintain it, sometimes with nothing but yellow tape cordoning off the missing planks. Instead, we have to walk all the way down New Hampshire and up the access ramp by the incongruous oceanfront tenement that used to be turquoise, but has now been painted a much less interesting shade of gray. No school, Jonas says frequently, frequently while we're walking, but also at other times. Jonah, what day is it, I ask. Saturday, he says, because he always knows. And do we have school on Saturdays? No, he says. That's right, I agree, no school today or tomorrow. Sometimes this quiets him for a while, but often the loop repeats almost immediately, no school. I used to find the constant iterations exasperating. Jonah obviously couldn't have forgotten in the span of 10 minutes, the answer to a question he already knew before he asked it the first time. Now I see in this scripting a desire to engage. It's hard to know for certain because Jonah's mind has always been stubbornly opaque to me, but I can't help but think that when Jonah starts again with no school, what he's really saying is that he wants me to pay attention to him, that he's looking for the back and forth of conversation, but doesn't know the conventions. He can't access the incredible data bank of niceties, hypothetical situations, jokes, and Doctor Who trivia my other kids tap into so naturally, their chatter so persistent, so demanding, that sometimes, even though I swore in the face of Jonah's language impairment that I would cherish every word any of my children ever uttered, I secretly wish they would for a few minutes just shut up. But saying no school triggers an exchange that is comfortable and familiar. So I say my lines with great enthusiasm and I'm rewarded by a squeeze from Jonah, tall enough now to put his arm around my shoulder. He nudges me until I wrap my arm around his back and we march for a while in lockstep like Laverne and Shirley. Just when I begin to tire of the awkward coordination necessary to keep us from tripping over each other's feet, Jonah presses his cheek against mine hard, and I decide I could go on like this forever. I'm just going to read one more passage from the end of this essay. The walk back from the pretzel factory, so the first big part of the essay is about the walk to the pretzel factory, which was the main goal of the walk. 
The walk back from the pretzel factory is often more challenging since the shops are open and Jonah knows exactly which ones stock the best flavors of Mike and Ike's. But I know also, and as we approach his favorite dollar store, I position myself between him and the entrance with its table strewn with sunglasses that I have picked over many times since I find sunglasses impossible to hold on to and so spend as little on them as possible. I have in the past encouraged Jonah to wear sunglasses since the sun is especially bright in this direction. And I still believe he would be more comfortable, but he always refuses, no glasses. Sometimes as we trudge home, Jonah dragging hot and heavy on my arm, I imagine teaching him to run, my favorite form of exercise. I no longer run the crazy distances I covered while training for the 2011 Philadelphia Marathon, but I still run four or five times, several times a week. And it's fun to think about Jonah and me training together for a 5K. It's appealing to consider how his fitness would improve and how meaningful it would be to share such an important part of my life with Jonah when so many other parts are inaccessible to him. But then I wonder whether Jonah would have been too tired and breathless to tell me a joke had we been running that amazing day last summer when he turned to me with a big smile on his face and said, she dreams about goats. I blinked at him for half a second recognizing immediately what he was talking about, but stunned at his obvious intention. Earlier that morning, while he was waiting for me to lace up my sneakers, Jonah had repeatedly played a sketch from Elmo's World about a girl who loves books. She loves them so much, she wears a book for a hat and books for shoes. She sleeps on a bed made of books in a house made of books. Once her passion has been firmly established, the narrator asks, do you know what she dreams about? Rabbits. I love rabbits too, the girl announces, the end. I've often been able to amuse Jonah by deliberately garbling the words to Sesame Street videos, but this was the first time Jonah, without any prompting, misquoted one to me. He knew very well the girl didn't dream about goats. He was trying to be funny. Goats, I said, she didn't dream about goats. She dreamt about peanut butter. Yes, Jonah said happily. No, you know she didn't, I said. Elephants, he said. We went back and forth the entire trip to the pretzel factory. Fish, boats, puppies, boots, cars, markers, ketchup. That's what you probably dream about, Jonah. Ketchup, I said. We were both laughing. It was the most magical exchange I ever had with my son, and we haven't shared another one like it all winter. Sometimes I'll ask, what does the girl who loves books dream about, Jonah? Does she dream about light bulbs? Sometimes he might even say yes and grin, but he doesn't offer any substitutions of his own. Much has been written recently exalting mindfulness or living in the moment, including obvious benefits like stress relief and others that aren't so intuitive, like staving off colds and improving military performance. And while I'm sure that mindfulness would in fact help me sleep better and lose weight, I'm just not very good at it, which I suspect puts me in the significant majority since if mindfulness were easy and natural, entire books wouldn't have been written about how to achieve it. While being a product of our frenetic culture is certainly cause enough, I discovered during a bioneurofeedback assessment that my neurological wiring particularly predisposes me against mindfulness. After attaching sensors to my scalp and monitoring my response to various computer tasks, the doctor pronounced me deficient in theta waves, the slow brain waves accessed during meditation. Although I had gone into the test secretly suspecting that bioneurofeedback was just high tech quackery, the results were surprisingly insightful. I am incapable of napping and being hypnotized. I don't enjoy jigsaw puzzles or fishing or sprawling on the beach. My mind is never quiet except during these slow, expansive mornings with Jonah, the hours drained of everything extraneous, so all that remains is the sun, the ocean, and the two of us, all moving gently along our predictable paths. I tell Jonah what day it is, and I tell him again. We entwine our fingers as we watch the fishing boats that dock across the inlet from our house, heading out to sea, and the shopkeepers setting out their plastic beach toys and racks of cheap sundresses. If my mind wanders briefly to an email I need to write or a poker hand I played the night before, Jonah always calls me back. What's number one? 
No wonder these walks inspired Jonah to push his limits. Call it magic, call it mindfulness, just other ways to describe a focused engagement uncompromised by YouTube and DVDs, phone calls and texts, kids, school, work, chores, rushing, driving, planning. Who doesn't stretch and unfurl under that brilliant light, the undivided attention of the beloved? It's taken me a while to relinquish my deeply ingrained hierarchies, running over walking, sweat and exertion over quiet companionship, speed and distance and heart rate over simply putting one foot in front of the other. Maybe someday Jonah may decide on his own that it's time to pick up the pace. But until then, we walk. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. That was beautiful. Um, so I'm going to ask you some questions, but I'm also going to invite all of the attendees. If you have questions for Amy, um, please put them in the Q&A queue at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, you know, I think what I what I love about your books and your writing in general, Amy, is that you really capture the experience. I think I've told you this, but you know, there's Jonah seems so similar to my daughter Jody in so many ways. She will walk ten miles if she can get a jar of dill pickles. Um, <laughs> the, all of, all of the essays in your book are really just so touching. But the one that really spoke to me the most is the one about. Um, how you approached Jonah's bar mitzvah. You know, I think for so many parents of special needs kids, these milestone events like bar mitzvah, first communion, even for those of us who are not all that religious, um, somehow these events take on extraordinary meaning. Could you talk a little bit about um, that, that essay that you wrote about your approach to Jonah's bar mitzvah? Yeah, I mean, that is my other favorite essay from this book. In fact, I wanted to, I wanted to call the book The Child Who Does Not Know How to Ask, which is the title of that essay. And my editor, I think she thought it was too Jewy, you know, and then like, not enough people would get that quote, which is from the Haggadah, which is what we read when we celebrate Passover. But yeah, and in that essay, I struggled with that too, because I am not a religious person. I never had a bat mitzvah myself but my other kids all went through the Hebrew school process and I had always planned on doing it because I felt it was a little hypocritical uh, to tell them it was important, but not important enough for me to take the time to do it. And I got it in my head that, that Jonah and I uh, were gonna do it together. Now, you know, this was, Jonah was way past the age of being bar mitzvah, typically traditionally. So I think he was 16 uh, when we, or 15, yeah, when 16 or 17, when we did the bar mitzvah. And I kept wondering, like, why am I putting him through this training? Because also, let me just say, I was kind of a taskmaster. And I was like, well, if Jonah is going to have a bar mitzvah, he's going to learn to read Hebrew. And I knew, but I mean, part of the reason was that I knew he could do it. Um, Jonah was hyperlexic as a boy and just basically kind of magically learned how to read. I'm not even sure how that happened. We just he knew he could read, we knew he could read before he could talk. And we knew because he started writing in chalk on the driveway, the titles of Sesame Street videos. And then he wrote my, our personal favorite FBI warning, which we thought was hilarious because they're like, whatever you think that means, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Um, and so I thought that, but, but hyperlexic kids, they have a really precocious, it, it's common autism. I think about 20%, up to 20% of autistic kids are hyperlexic. And it does involve this precocious ability to read, but it's often unaccompanied by comprehension. So Jonah can read anything. He usually doesn't understand much of what he reads, but fortunately for us, that's how reformed Jews are kind of taught to go through the bar bat mitzvah process. At least my other kids were, they learned how to read Hebrew without understanding it. And so I thought that Jonah could do the same. And, and he did. I and mean, actually, Joan, one of Jonah's Hebrew tutors is here. Barbara Oslik is, I see that she's joined. And so uh, we're really grateful how patient she was to work with Jonah. And he did learn how to read Hebrew. And I learned how to read Hebrew and I read from the Torah and it was a very special moment for me 
<laughs> as I would describe in the essay, Jonah was kind of in a rough mood that day, and he was just pers perseverating on on a certain DVD, and he was biting his hand, and he wanted to leave, and it was so. And it was it didn't have anything to do with I think anything that was happening in the moment because he had kind of been in a bad mood before we even left the house. But it was spectacular to me when I talk about the, the just the strength of the relationships that I have built through the autism community, you know, what it meant to have you and Jonah um, here organizing this for me. It was kind of like that for my for our B'nai Mitzvah, because so many of our old aides and doctors and teachers came back for this. We didn't even invite any friends and hardly any family uh, to this because uh, it was really just about Jonah and the people who were super important in his life. And I just couldn't believe uh, all the people who drove hours or flew across the country to be there for that moment because Jonah had really meant something for him to them. And to me, that's what those moments are about, right? It's about the community coming together in support of a family. And it's a moment of acceptance and beauty that no matter what, you know, we've got you guys. And that's what it felt like to me. And jo Jonah obviously didn't feel that way at the time, but we made a, uh, a book of pictures and, you know, kind of describing the day. And I hope that he'll look, he looks at it and remembers, you know, that all these people were there for him and, and, and feels a sense of that connection. But it was a very special day. Uh, I, I, I remember that so vividly. I think in our family, or for me, what happened was our synagogue sent me a date. You know, they said, Bat Mitzvah date, Jody Singer, June 5th. And I was like, oh my God, Bat Mitzvah date. And I was thinking, is this date just gonna pass? What are we gonna do? Um, and I just felt like if I if we didn't do something, it would be like getting the diagnosis again on that date. Yeah. So um, you know, our our synagogue had something called sharing Shabbat that was for younger children. She went to that. She uh, learned a couple of lines of Torah. She learned. Um, you know, she she didn't understand it just as just as you said. I think she's the only person in in the history of Judaism to be bat mitzvah holding a box of Cheez Its. Um, <laughs> And then she took to the, and, and then I remember at the very end of the service, the trustee, the member of the board of trustees came to present her with a gift on behalf of the temple. It was a kiddish cup and a, a copy of the Torah. And she started screaming, no book, no book, and pushed it away. <laughs> okay, we're done here. And then we came back and had a party in my backyard where we just did the hokey pokey about 25 times. And it was a raucous celebration. It was the craziest bat mitzvah ever. Um, but I wanted to get back to what you said about the community of parents of severe, of kids with severe autism, because that is one of the questions that someone has entered into the chat. Um, someone wrote in, her son is seven and he's profoundly autistic. What advice would you give to a mother at the beginning of her family's journey? Hmm. <sighs> it's hard. Those beginning years were really tough. Um, you know, it's not always obvious when kids are super young, whether or not where they're going to end up on the spectrum. You know, you can have a kid that looks pretty, pretty impaired at age two or three, who by the time they're in high school, they might be indistinguishable from peers. But when you first realize that your kid is not going to be Sean from the good doctor uh, and is facing kind of a lifetime of being dependent and uh, requ requiring a ton of supports, I think that the best thing that you can do is connect with that larger community. Uh, the, you know, the, the National Council on Severe Autism. We have a website, we have a lot of blog posts. Right now we're featuring, uh, we've declared April to be Autism Action Month and there are a lot of blog posts about just practical things that people have found that have made their lives easier. Um, and there are, a lot, there are a lot of really helpful tips that people that, that families can share either there or also there are several Facebook groups that are uh, that are just their kind their kind of private groups. You, you might have to search them and apply. You know, answer some questions uh, about uh, you know why you're interested. 
but in these groups specifically for parents of severely autistic kids you'll be able to get answers to questions like my kid keeps leaving the house and i put on every childproof lock i i can i can find and he's still getting out what do i do and to which i always am happy to respond because this was one of my favorite solutions we found which is that we put end up putting exterior you know code locks on all our exterior doors so you have to put in a code to go in or out we have no keys anymore and that stopped jonah's elopement it, it didn't happen after that so i think there are lots of practical solutions to the problems that um that that will arise you know i wish i could say give you some really optimistic you know kind of pep talk that it's all going to be okay but it probably won't all be okay i'd be shocked if it were all okay but you know I will also say that connecting with other parents, I, I connect with parents a lot because parents get in touch with me about ECT still, even though I wrote that book in 2014, or about other advocacy projects. And every single time I get off the phone or now the Zoom meeting, I always think if she lived next door, we'd be best friends. You know, it's just that connection with another parent that gets it is really strengthening and really has gotten me through some dark places. So my best suggestion to you would be to, to, to go out and connect with people. And also, because this is really important, the services, the, the parents who get the services for their kids are the ones who know what services are out there, who know how to navigate the system, who are connected to all the decision makers. So it's not just, it's not fair, but that's how that's who will get you know the very kind of limited amount of resources that some you know that are available in some places so just make sure you're that educated connected parent uh, so that you can you can get whatever your kid needs along the way you know i wanted to jump in for just one second and 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 mention um that our son daniel's bar mitzvah was also an incredibly moving experience for us one of the highlights of our parenting experience but I wanted to point out in regard to parent resources that one of the people I see on the attendee list is Mary Beth Walsh, who's a friend of ours and who um, is a customer of store, particularly her son Ben is in her store all the time. But she's written a lot about autism and faith. She wrote a booklet and she's had some fabulous um, responses in the Catholic community and her Catholic church experiences. So I just wanted to say that for parents, you know, if you're lucky to be in in a place where your house of worship is warm and welcoming, that there are many opportunities and that's something to really check out. And to also to check out Mary Beth's work on that's Mary Beth Walsh. Thanks, Jonah. So we have a question from Wen Shang Li. She says that um, she read your book and she wanted you to speak a little bit more about John Robeson's visit to your house and describe how John and Jonah interacted with each other. Yeah, that was that was an amazing day. Just for some context, uh, for those of you who don't know about this story, uh, John Elder Robeson is a very prominent and an autistic self-advocate, meaning that he has autism himself, but he's um, you know a very accomplished author and advocate um, and very articulate. He served on the IAC and. Um, so he's much more mildly affected by his autism. But we had kind of a little encounter at an IAC meeting a few years ago where uh, Allison had invited me to come and speak about the housing crisis facing people with autism. And after, during the break, John Robeson came up to me and said, well, I just think that I should, you know, autistic people should decide for ourselves uh, where we live. And I said, I completely agree that you should decide where you live, but, but my son, Jonah, he can't decide. Uh, he just isn't, he has an intellectual disability. He's not capable of making these important decisions. And we, it went on from there. I'm not going to, you know, uh, go into all the details, but I will say that I ended up saying, John, if you don't believe me, just come meet Jonah. And I put out that invitation, not only to John, but I, I put it out publicly to any autistic self-advocate who wanted who, to meet Jonah and see what severe autism really looked like. And no one took me up on it until uh, when Karen Zucker and John Donvan were doing, making their documentary based on their book in a different key, which is just coming out now, the movie. I hope everybody goes to see it when, when they can. Um, 
I don't think it's available maybe right this second, but it's coming out at certain film festivals and I'm sure it will be available and brought for broader distribution in the near future. Anyway, they Karen called me. She was featured, they were featuring our family as the family of severe autism. And Karen asked if the invitation was still open because they wanted to bring John Robeson in to meet Jonah and film it. And I thought that was incredibly brave uh, of John to come and meet Jonah knowing it would be filmed. And even though this part didn't make it into the movie, um, it was a really important moment for me because John met Jonah and, you know, they didn't interact that much. You know, Jonah isn't very conversational. He, he wasn't upset that John was there. Uh, we went walking, um, you know, we just kind of were walking around where I live and, and Jonah did very companionably put his arm through John's. He was, Jonah was walking between us. Jonah really likes a lot of physical contact and John was cool with it. But at the end, John freely admitted that he had no idea what Jonah was thinking. You know, just because they shared this diagnosis didn't give him any insight into how someone with with also a significant intellectual disability and very little abstract language. You know, he had no idea how what how Jonah perceived the world. And he completely agreed that myself and my husband as his parents, that we knew him best and we were best positioned to, to make decisions for him. And I thought that was really important because that isn't by any means a uh, consensus position from the autistic self-advocates who often do claim that because they share this diagnosis, they, that somehow privileges them over parents in making decisions for, for people severely impacted by autism. So it was a great day. And, uh, and you know, Jonah and Jen, John and I kept in touch for a while after that. I think actually he's become really burnt out in terms of autism advocacy because he's been slammed by some of the more aggressive autistic self-advocates who don't care for his kind of speaking with parents and you know and re respecting parents' point of view and kind of positioning himself as somewhere in the middle. So uh, he hasn't really been very active in Facebook except to talk about his car business. So I hope he comes back to it because we really need you know his voice uh, in this in these debates. So Amy, it would be great if you could expand on your thoughts about neurodiversity because we have several questions um, from attendees about, um, so one, one person wrote, um, do you believe in neurodiversity? The con she said she likes the concept of neurodiversity, but people take it too far. What, what are your thoughts? And uh, Marjorie Mathis asks, um, how have you been able to explain to the self, to self advocates that severe or even moderate autism is different than their own experience? I mean, other than John, what what are your thoughts on on neurodiversity? Okay, well, the second question is easier, Marjorie. I haven't, and I've stopped trying. You know, I realized a while ago that I that just trying to insisting, you know. Um, getting involved in debates with with some of these more militant self advocates was was really fruitless, you know, I would say, um, I would try to describe Jonah's very significant impairments and they would just say, but what does he think about this? And I'd be like, no, 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 <laughs> you know, you're not getting it. And I realized that I'm not talking to them anymore. I'm really talking to the public and policymakers, you know, people who don't have the proverbial dog in the race, you know, who don't know anything about autism, but it sounds good to say that, you know, People with autism all want to their own apartment and their own competitive minimum wage job, and they just don't want to. They want society to accommodate their quirkiness. You know that sounds great, but you know that's not the reality for our population. So I'm just talking to people and trying to educate them about the realities of severe autism. But I don't. I I, I don't think you can convince the, the self advocates. But when they went to considering autism and identity like homosexuality instead of a a disability, like I think we lost them then. Like once you embrace that identity, it's very hard to to kind of disentangle that, uh, even using the best common sense and rational arguments. But do I believe in neurodiversity? Yeah, of course. I mean, I believe in in that there are many different neurological presentations. I believe that there's a whole gamut, and it goes from people who are, you know, Albert Einstein's and Stephen Hawking's to people who are. Um, you know, so profoundly impaired, they have the functioning level of infants, and that's an incredible range. What I don't believe is that um, 
that autism is, is not a disability. You know, I believe that neurodiversity at some point shades into pathology and that it's, it's kind of there we need to intervene and that it's not wrong to try to cure people like Jonah, not that that's ever gonna be possible or try to develop therapies that alleviate some of their more significant, uh, you know, kind of struggles like to stop aggression and self-injury, uh, to try to boost communication, to try to solve, you know, all the myriad of challenges that they're facing. So I guess to answer that question is, I, I think that I believe in neurodiversity more than the neurodiversity proponents, because I believe that, you know, you have to accept where people are, no matter what that functioning level is and try to just make their lives as good as possible and also provide the supports and services that that individual person needs, whether that's a really inclusive uh, setting like a job at Wawa, which, which is our convenience store, or whether it's um, a sheltered workshop or whether it's a, an art program during the day just for people with autism. You know, I just believe that that people need to be kind of met where they are, whereas I feel like the neurodiversity people think that everybody should be treated the same, which is how, which is basically as, as non-disabled people are treated. And I don't think that that works for the vast majority of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's like a happy fiction that we just keep trying to tell ourselves. I, I totally agree. And I would just add that one of the, one of the things that someone has said to me, and, and that is part of some of the neurodiversity platform is this idea that um, that Jody doesn't speak because I created a home environment that was so stifling um, that she chooses not to speak to me. It's so reminiscent of Ruth Benelheim and the blame the mother and refrigerator parenting and you know this this idea that I don't love my daughter and this is her response. It is so insulting and offensive to me that it, it gets difficult for me to, to get past that. But our next question. Um, is tapping into your knowledge and expertise with regard to housing. Wow. So uh, we have some people who are clearly up on the latest news and want to know more about um, the new disability guidance that's coming out that is not favorable, uh, that home and community-based service waiver guidance that's coming out with regard to uh, severe autism and intermediate care facilities and the, the issues with regard to limiting the housing options that would be available for individuals with severe autism who are on the waiver. Okay, I just need a little clarification there. Is that the, like the proposed HCBS? I forget I think that. that's what this person is referring to. That. Okay, so the, you know, so that hasn't happened yet. It's just being proposed. Oh, that's fine. I am totally up on this question because I was just working on NCSA's position um, on on this bill, which is, or I don't even know, proposed legislation, regulation, I'm not exactly sure what you would call it, but while it sounds good in the sense that it's designed to eliminate the HCBS wait list, which would be amazing if everybody could get the services that they need and people didn't have to wait decades or like until parents just keel over and die before their kids get, uh, you know, get waivers. There are a lot of issues with that, the proposal. Um, including the fact that it would uh, really end up de facto defunding the ICFs, the intermediate care facilities, which are kind of like, um, you know, they're more intensive disability specific settings. I hate to use the word institutional because it's so, uh, has so many negative connotations, but the, the idea is that, you know, some adults with, and some kids with with autism and other intellectual and developmental disabilities have medical and behavioral challenges that make community living unsafe and undesirable, and they have no interest in it, honestly. And, but this, this proposal would kind of target, again, those larger settings and um, would only provide funding in inclusive settings, it would only provide transportation, transportation for activities in the community without defining any of these terms. So the, the, it's very problematic. NCSA is gonna be releasing, a, you know, I don't know if it's a position paper, or maybe we'll be um, sending out like a model, uh, like email that interest that concerned parents could send to their uh, their their state reps about about this issue, but yeah, it is it's scary because it seems like the Biden administration, you know, although many of us were you know served on Biden's disability community committee and you know we're um, strong supporters of the administration, the administration really has 
kind of drunk the inclusion Kool-Aid and um, just is listening to the self-advocates and letting them set the, the kind of set the agenda. In fact, one of the provisions of that act is that everything's going to be decided by a committee that's largely comprised of autistic self-advocates, you know, which is, you know, crazy to me that that people who are not eligible for these services because they're they're you know because they're um, they're not going to require residential vocational and therapeutic services like that are going to be determining what those who consume the bulk of the services what they'll be able to access. So we're going to be very strongly pushing for for families to be represented in all of these decision you know making bodies. So we had another question about housing. This one was specific to um, what success have you had with legislators in Pennsylvania? Huh. Okay, we'll call that a big fat zero. Um, Pennsylvania is one of the most restrictive states in the country. In fact, I, I can't get even, I can't even about Pennsylvania because uh, you can't build anything larger than three people for the three people in Pennsylvania. And it's, it's all because our ODP, which is the Office of Developmental Programs is so, um, is, is kind of so aligned ideologically with the autistic self-advocates that just a day or two ago, maybe it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, somebody sent, circulated an email that ODP had circulated that was advising people in honor of, of Autism Awareness Month or Accept, Autism Acceptance Month, whatever they were calling it, to consult the website of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network about the experience of autistics. This is coming from our Office of Developmental Programs, which is supposed to be really invested in supporting families. And yet they are just all about, uh, you know, the all inclusion all the time. So I haven't gotten at all very far, but I will say that there has been some movement on that in the sense that Together for Choice, which is a national advocacy organization that works on issues around housing, has kind of gotten involved in the Pennsylvania landscape because of how strict the regulations are. And I'm hoping that they might have some luck prying it open just, just a little bit. So I'm, I'm hopeful for change, but you know, Joan is 22, he still lives with us and we have no plans for that to change anytime in the near future, simply because of a lack of, of any options that I find to be tenable. So for families, uh, for parents who are um, here today, what can they do to let their voice be heard with regard to the housing issue? Yeah, well, I think that these kind of open comment periods, you know, like, so right now you can comment on the HCBS Act um, until I think the end of the month and, you know, make sure you get your, you make your voices heard, you, you know, submit anytime, anytime any of these acts are proposed, there's always an open comment period. So make sure you comment, ask the people you know to comment and just stay in touch with the organizations who are organizing these, like these, um, I don't want to call it like comment drives, but just that if you follow NCSA or Together for Choice or the Coalition for Community Choice, these are organizations that are involved in, in housing and they'll alert you to the opportunities to weigh in. And also it really helps, I think, to just to reach out to your local, uh, for your kind of your, your senators, your your Congress people, speak to their staffers, make sure they understand how harmful these policies are to, if these are, if these are your kids or your neighbor's kids, the, the, how the severely intellectually and developmentally disabled are harmed by policies that close down the intensive disability specific settings that they often require to thrive. So um, just kind of talking about it whenever you can to the people who might be able to make a difference is I think that the best that you can do. Okay, so moving on to what might have to be our last topic. Uh, we have a, a question from Max Rosen who says, I'm training to become a doctor. As a parent of a young adult with severe autism, how would you recommend that we move forward to improve medical care for children and adults with severe autism? Hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. So the medical care for kids with severe autism, I think all, almost always the, the, hap, the happiest outcomes that I have seen have involved a, like a team approach to, to kind of treating the severely autistic child. 
So you have the child psychiatrist, you have the developmental pediatrician, you know, you have the parents all kind of working together, maybe with other specialists, neurologists who might be treating the seizures. I'm trying to think of all the doctors Jonas had. Um, and it's really important that those doctors all talk to one another. And it's also really important that that parents, this is just to flip it to the parents' perspective for a minute, may find doctors who are experienced treating severely autistic kids and not just treat autistic kids in general. Because, you know, sometimes not all, not all doctors know uh, everything about kind of the best ways of treating the aggression, the aggression and self-injurious behaviors that too often plague our kids. Uh, you know, my first book was about the use of ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, which was the one thing that we found that stabilized Jonah's moods. He went from attacking us every day, often multiple times, to, to not uh, attacking us at all. It's, I mean, without ECT, Jonah would be on a locked ward now, I have no doubt. And, you know, I get a lot of, I've done a lot of advocacy around that also because if you consider like the Venn diagram of doctors who treat autistic kids and the doctors who provide ECT, they're typically geriatric psychiatrists because that's the population that most likely to get ECT, like those two circles don't even touch. So it's been a lot of educating child psychiatrists about how ECT can be useful in certain presentations, you know, in certain cases of treating really dangerous behaviors in autism and educating ECT providers about why they should take these out of control autistic, you know, young people into their offices when they're usually kind of uh, treating very tame and timid, like people who are 90 years old. So, um, you know, just being educating yourself as a doctor about different types of ways of treating these behaviors, recognizing that they're not always a part of the autism. That's a huge thing. Uh, too many doctors tell too many families that these dangerous behaviors are part of the autism and instead of recognizing that they're, they might be driven by comorbid conditions that can be treated the same way they'd be treated in, uh, in the non-disabled population. So yeah, I think approaching this medically is really important. I know as a historian of medicine that the social model of disability reigns supreme, but I think the medical model of disability works really well with our population and I will never stop fighting for medical, uh, the right medical treatments for my son. And I know that many other families feel the same. You know, I would, I, I agree with everything you said. I just would add one thing, um, Max, which is listen to the parents, right? We, my daughter is going through a, a medical situation right now. It has nothing to do with her autism. Well, I mean, she unfortunately had a seizure, fell, um, and fractured her jaw. So, you know, we've been seeing doctors who deal with jaws, not autism. Um, she had to have a procedure that then involved putting a brace on. I must have said a hundred times, be sure she's not going to pull it off. Be sure she's not going to pull it off. And, you know, the, the doctor told me it's impossible. It's impossible. It stopped asking. It's impossible. She was awake from surgery, five minutes, pulled the whole thing off. So, you know, now they're saying, oh, we're going to write a journal article about this. It's so, oh my God. So anyway, listen to the parents. <laughs> that would be the only thing I would, I would add. So uh, we're approaching uh, the end of our time. I would really just encourage everyone who has not already read Amy's book to read it. I think we can all find so much uh, about our own family experience and can really relate to so many of the situations that Amy describes um, and uh, the experiences that she writes about so beautifully. It's just a, a lovely book. Very few books about autism make me cry anymore, but this one did. Um, so if you would like to purchase a copy, um, please do so through Words Bookstore um, by going to bit.ly slash words we walk. And again, I wanna thank Ellen and Jonah because they have both agreed uh, that all the proceeds from sales of Amy's book tonight will be donated to the Autism Science Foundation. So thank you again for that. Um, and um, I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight. I want to thank everyone who submitted such great questions. Um, and I particularly uh, want to thank Jonah and Ellen for co-hosting and also most especially Amy 
um, not only for being here tonight, but for writing a book that I think has brought our community together. And as she described earlier in her talk, it's so important for we as parents of uh, kids with severe autism to stick together, to work together, to learn from each other, um, and to continue to be support for each other. So my thanks to Amy, and thank you all for being here. Good night. Good night. Thank you.